All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started now because today should be a, a relatively relaxing drawing day, but there's a, a lot to do. Um, and I want to, to dive right in to give you guys the most time possible. So we're working on toned paper today. It's a landscape scene that, um, and I want to show you kind of the order that I would normally uh, work on something like this. Um, this drawing took me a little longer than an hour. It was probably about an hour and a half to do the different steps. Um, so, you know, don't worry if you find that you are not able to kind of get the quality of line and the fineness that you might have if you worked on something like this a bit longer. But I would ask that perhaps sometime during the week or, you know, maybe this fall, that you try this particular image again, because it's a really good one, um, kind of low key for, for practicing these techniques. So let me go ahead and get us started here. Okay, <laughs> another summer of drawing, class number 16. We're, we're getting down there to the final final. So we're still on the theme of home and this one is Tuscan Dream. And I'll explain what the connection to home is in just a second here. So the connection for me um, was that, you know, it had always sort of been a dream of mine, this idea of, you know, oh, living in Tuscany or, or just the, you know, the, gosh, the landscape there is extraordinary. I, I love Italy overall, regardless. And there's something about these little farmhouses on, on top of these small hills throughout Tuscany that's so attractive. I was lucky enough to end up um, staying in one when I was uh, much younger, kind of by mistake. I, um, I was on my way to Sicily and the, the flights had got screwed up and I was going to have to stay in an, an airport on, all night. And some kind people um, said, well, why don't you come and stay in our place? And it was, uh, it was one of these sorts of, of structures. So for me, this has always been kind of that, you know, if, you, if one was to think of, oh, the dream place I'd like to live, for me, this is it. But I really liked this image for this class today because it incorporates um, some simple things, but also some kind of challenging things. One is this really interesting foreground. And then we've got the focal point kind of in the midground. And then we've got this beautiful atmospheric background, which, and all of this is really well suited for toned paper, but it's also very easy to kind of put too much of everything down. So I'm going to coach you pretty carefully through the steps that we're going to do today, and you'll see kind of how I work my way into something like this. So how do we interpret this scene? You know, what are we drawing here? Um, obviously, we've got this you know little little house on top of this knoll we've got the trees but we've also got this really great foreground with the poppies and the grasses you know how much detail do we add in how to different differentiate the foreground from the midground um and so the answer to that is really simple it's varying the pencil type uh and by that i mean you know are we using the very fine like long academic pointed lead or are we using a beveled lead or you know just some other type of lead you happen to have you know your mechanical pencil your regular pointed pen pencils so that variety and then color which it would be adding in white because that's really going to help us with the background and then stroke direction and so this is really going to be you know the key today is not just using the different pencil leads in different places, but also using stroke direction. I mean, if you look at this scene right now, you can sort of see how there's a horizontal, uh, you know, horizontal lines running back and forth um, in these fields. Uh, up, up close, they're really going from left to right, going upwards. Um, in that midsection that you see just before the building, they're running uh, pretty horizontal right to left. And then there are these undulating hills in the distance. And those um, can be, uh, we can sort of imagine that they have directional lines sort of following the curve of the land. And so we'll be working those in um, as we go along. So we're going to skip the no tan today. <laughs> we're just going to, because this is a good composition. We already know it's a good composition. I, I really want you to spend all the time on drawing. Um, normally, of course, I would, I would be asking you to, you know, squint at this scene and look for the, you know, the sort of the rhythm of the dark and light shapes. This scene already has, it. it's already a good composition. But 
a few things that you would think about is which uh, drawing tool or technique to use where, which is what I'm going to sort of coach you through, and also consider where to use directional line to describe form. Um, you know, not only the undulating land, but also the uprights of, of um, you know, the plants in the foreground, uprights of the, of the trees, uh, ways to have um, finer lines or thicker lines in different places to to direct your eye, because as we know, contrast and also detail um, draws your eye from one place to another. And also perspective is kind of important here. Um, this particular landscape, you don't have to draw it exactly as you see it, but, but those angles are relatively specific. If they were more acute, it would look more hilly. If, if it was flatter, it wouldn't really give the right sense of the scene. So do, you know, do check those angles. One thing, that I found really important was the angle of the top of the roof of the building is really quite specific. Um, if you made it make it too pointy, it won't look like that type of, of um, house. So those are places where you just sort of look out for those perspective lines because you don't have to be detailed in the house. But if you get the angle of the of the roof right, it'll kind of it'll make it. Everybody will understand what's going on. All right, I just wanted to show you really quickly what my drawing setup today was, which is basically um, over on the left hand side, I have this box of pen art, uh, uh, pencils. And these are those shin art, uh, shin, shin hand pencil, uh, art pencils. Uh, sorry, I'll write that out and, and give you a link in the PDF. But these are, these are some new pencils, a new pencil set I got, and I really like them. And I kind of now keep that whole set for that kind of quasi academic drawing where I've got the um, a long lead so I don't have to worry about sharpening it. I can then also use it, you know, use more or less of it depending on, you know, whether I want wide strokes or, or, or tiny strokes. Um, so those are pretty pointy. And then I've got an assortment of types of pencils just because they were what I had have, have on hand in the next little box over and uh, in the middle. And those are the ones I keep kind of as beveled pencils. And you see my piece of sandpaper up there um, for, for getting that bevel back if I if I lose it. Then I've got an assortment of things I just always use, a couple of black wing pencils, which I tried out and I, I kind of like, um, a mechanical pencil, an ebony pencil. Um, I've got white charcoal pencils, drawing stumps, um, erasers. <laughs> so the whole bevy is is laid out. But what I, I love these new, um, these new Shinhan uh, art drawing pencils and it was a pretty inexpensive box what i'm considering now is maybe i get another set and have those all be beveled and then i just have two boxes with all of those things in um you know it's it's something to consider but i thought that since my collection had sort of developed through the course of this summer you might like to see sort of where i was ending up um with with the drawing tools i keep going to all the time all right, and then this is something I just wanted to show you before we got started. Um, I used a darker paper here than, than I end up drawing on, but I wanted to show you this idea of how, um, when we talk about academic drawing and using the, the fine point, in previous classes, I've talked about, you know, making these very smooth transitions, you know, little tiny, holding the pencil way back near the end, very lightly making these little tiny circles or tiny hatching going in different directions to create a smooth sense. Well, here I'm talking about, and this can be done in white or, or you know, regular graphite pencil, um, using, uh, still holding the pencil back away from the, from the end. You want to have a nice stroke, but using directional hatching and just building it up as you need to, to create a sense of form. So in this case, I just sort of made a a spherical form of some sort. And you can see I sort of, you know, tried to show that there was a, a lit side and an unlit side just by using lines that kind of followed the form of what I was thinking of a sphere. Um, and then I just overlapped them more and more until I got a highlight and, and left the other part um, just being toned paper. And then over here on the right hand side, at the bottom, I'm showing you, uh, you know, if you just sort of lightly mass in white, or if you go a little bit darker, or you can make strokes that go from dark to light, or you can make strokes that sort of follow the form. And that if we're thinking about how we're going to, you know, deal with that background on this particular image today, this idea of using directional strokes in whatever direction you feel like, you know, there's it, 
you know, some of the some of the areas on this photograph we're looking at today obviously indicate that fields have a certain direction to them. But in the background, we can't really see that. This is going to be your interpretation. But what you do want to do is remember to leave certain areas the color of the paper. Don't color absolutely everything in. Um, but you can vary it any way you want to. And what I did um, in my kind of interpretation of the background that we'll be using is when I got to that very top, the most distant area, I went ahead and smoothed that out with a, with a drawing stump. I used a clean drawing stump. You could easily use your finger or a rag or something like that, Q-tip. Um, just because at that point, my feeling was, well, if those lines are getting further and further away, they'd be less distinct. And then that kind of gives a little bit more feeling of distance or sky or whatever it would um, would possibly be. But I wanted to show you this up close because um, as I'm using a, a slightly lighter toned paper to do the actual drawing, it might be a little bit more difficult to see how directional lines look, particularly in the white. OK, let's get started. So the very first step will be just to use a very light pencil and a really light touch. Uh, you can sort of you know, see here that it's almost difficult to see what I did to start with, to, to sketch the main angles of the scene. Now, that means don't sketch the, the little house yet and the trees and such. Really, all you're sketching is that triangular, you know, sort of pyramid shape that you've got going there of that hill with, the, with that house you know, at the top of it, the roof line almost continues up. But what's more important is indicating, okay, where is this foreground? You know, where, where are these fields ending? Where are these lines of hedges ending? Uh, you know, kind of what's going on. And not putting too many lines in for the background, which is everything behind the building, behind this main building, um, because you'll be doing a lot of work uh, at, in that part using the white. So I'm going to um, let you start uh, drawing this. I'm going to move on one slide to show you um, what I did next. Uh, I'll come. Um, I'll move back again in a minute, just so you understand where we go next. Next is adding in some of those details of where the darks are, where the building is, you know, where the main trees are. But we're not there yet. Right now, all you're going to worry about is trying to get the main angles right. So one of the things I did while I was doing this was I also started noticing where some of the undulation of the of the land was. Not not a lot, but I did see that there was kind of a good um, divot in in that big swath of land uh, closer to us than the house on the hill. And so I was like, hmm, when I do my directional lines, I'm probably going to want to know where the dark and the light variation is, um, you know, to that area. I might even want to know where some of those uh, large shadow shapes are falling. So I'm working on this sketch. Uh, let me see. I've got it right behind me. I'll, I'll put it up in the window just so, so you can kind of see. It's not enormous, but it's a little bit larger than than what I, I do. I'll show, show it to you in, in real life again at the very end. But it's about oh six by nine inches something like that um and so i was able to work a you know a little bit more detail than than i normally do if i were to go uh larger than that i would probably spend even more time trying to you know mark out very 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 lightly <laughs> um you know because you can you can erase your lines as you go but you know, you're giving yourself a road road map. You don't have to. It doesn't. Drawing doesn't have to be difficult. You know, it ha, it'll come with its own challenges for sure. But you know, these initial lines are so important. So when I'm painting people, for example, and I'm I'm trying to get you know the face and the body and stuff in, I spend a lot of time up front just trying to get the angles right. You know, making sure everything lines up the way that I want it to. And then the, the same applies if I'm drawing, you know, or painting flowers or buildings or animals or whatever it happens to be. You know, you're laying that, that basic structure. If you were building um, a building and you didn't put the framing up correctly, the rest of the house is absolutely not going to work. <laughs> and um, the same thing applies to, to a drawing. So the little bit of time spent laying out these initial lines you know, you decide which lines are important. 
you know, I've, I've got my idea of which lines are important, but it gets you to start looking. You know, it really wasn't until I started doing that that I started to notice all those other little farmhouse buildings out there. And I had to start thinking in advance at that point, well, what am I going to do with them? You know, are they, are they important? Do I need to have them in there? Should I indicate them? And I was able to, you know, I don't have to make the decision on that right now, but I was able to at least start realizing that, you know, there were some potential issues in the background as well. All right, I'm going to move on to that next step just so you can kind of see. So what I did once I got those lines established was I started to go in and go, okay, um, I don't have to worry too much about, you know, the detail. Um, I used actually a lighter pencil than you see here. Um, particularly for these first couple of shots, I've darkened things up a bit just so you can actually see them. But I was using, I think, an F or an HB pencil, but very, very lightly. I'm working on Reeves paper, and Reeves is extremely soft. Um, it doesn't like erasing very much. You actually almost just sort of pounce your needed rubber eraser on the surface and kind of lift off a little bit of color. So I try to be really careful. But I, I did decide, hey, I need to start. I'm not going to worry about the foreground yet. That's going to be its own problem. But I do want to kind of establish where some of these dark areas are. You know, get that roof angle just right. Um, I don't think I have this as, as a bigger image to show you uh, right yet. So, but you can get the general idea. And then I saw that, you know, that hedgerow that was running through the middle of the of the scene. And I said, yeah, okay, that needs a little bit of, of definition. Um, there are some trees to the left of the main hill that need a little definition. And there's a little tiny bit of um, just behind the, the farmhouse hill. There's another little building. Probably, I probably want to indicate that as well. I, I did not put anything else in the background. I just kind of kept it to the foreground. So at this point, this is just another opportunity to kind of assess, you know, okay, there are a lot of interesting things going on here. It's a little bit more complicated of a scene than it might appear <laughs> for, at first um, glance. And doesn't that happen all the time, right? You start looking at it and you're, you're like, wow, there are a lot of decisions that have to be made. So I am going to move on to the next step. I know you guys haven't finished this yet, but I just want you to sort of keep seeing in advance where you're trying to go. So the thing that I did next after this was I was like, all right, I love this foreground. It has some really great stuff in it. And this drawing won't be anywhere near as interesting if I don't include that. But if I wait till the end to do things, you know, like normally I add it, as you know, I usually add, the, the white in closer to the end rather than at the beginning. But if I don't indicate where some of these lights need to go in the foreground, I love these grasses. Well, then I'm, you know, if, I, if I've colored everything in basically, you know, put pencil behind everything, then all it'll end up being is a smeary gray mess <laughs> by the time I get to a, the foreground. So, you know, I decided, well, what I can do is I can do what I call reserving the whites or the, the highlights in the foreground by just putting down, you know, some light stuff right now so I can see what's going on, um, you know, just to kind of give a little bit of a feel of that, those grasses and, and where some of these highlights are and, and allow me to start thinking a little bit about how I'm going to handle the foreground. Now, the benefit to this was that I immediately realized I could save myself some work by then not having to um, basically color in and graphite right behind these grasses, um, you know, which would be very difficult to do because the toned paper would be some would act as some of this mid mid ground, you know, green, um, and I wouldn't have to worry about it. So I was like, okay, so I'm going to indicate right now where those grasses could go. And then I said, and I can now start, because um, I've got my kind of my general scene is laid out here. I can start on some more of this foreground and kind of get it differentiated from the midground by using beveled pencil leads up front close to me and not beveled pencil leads anywhere else. Because the chunkiness and the, the big lines of the beveled pencil will create this feeling of those items being closer and finer lines 
elsewhere in the in the drawing will create the feeling of those items being further away. So I am I'm just going to show you how that ended up looking. So I started at that point adding in some darker lines where where I, you know, it, using the beveled end of the pencils, which are wider, um, to sort of indicate where the foliage is. I'm going to move this forward one slide and then I'm going to go back so you can keep an eye on what's going on. But I'm trying to sort of show you how, how I went along. So that was by the time I added in all the rest of the beveled pencil up front, I then, then I just stopped right there. So let me go back to this. Um, so you can see that just a little bit more clearly how I sort of reserved those those whites and now I'm going to go back to where you can see your image a lot larger. So I hope you don't mind me bouncing around like that, but it's very difficult to see that little picture in the corner and I did want you to see sort of how the pencil strokes worked. Now I didn't add in any more definition to the grass than just the white at this point because I know that later on I probably will want to add some more pencil, but I I want to be careful. I don't want to overdo the foreground with detail. Um, I really feel, for me at least, the focal point of the drawing is is the, the building and those trees uh, on the hill. Um, and the foreground is sort of secondary in importance. Um, and so if, I, if I'm careful about how much I'm putting down where, um, I can kind of modulate, I can kind of regulate as I go what's getting darker, what's getting more detailed, what's getting lighter. So this is very much the same approach that I use in painting. Um, you know, I'll put down my darks and do that kind of thing. I'll put down, sometimes I'll go ahead just like this and I'll say, hey, I'd like to find, I'd like to figure out where my lightest areas are going to be as well. And then I can judge my relative values knowing that, you know, these areas are the lightest, the others need to be the darkest, and I can kind of make everything else move in between. This is a, a useful uh, approach because it gives you, a, once again, a roadmap to where the rest of the painting and or drawing is going. Um, it's always very difficult if you get really dark too quickly or really light too quickly to be able to backtrack or, um, or, or make the entire rest of the drawing or painting you know, conform to that very light or the very dark. So I do like to sort of ease in, you know, okay, I add a bit more detail here, a little bit more there. What does that mean? How do I have to change things about? All right, so the other thing I wanted to point out was were these poppies. So I, I put here, note the poppies. <laughs> you probably wonder what that means. Well, for me, and I'm just gonna page forward so you can see what that means. Um, I just drew tiny little, tiny light, light, light outlines around where these poppies are going to be. Because my feeling was, I, I don't, I'm not going to use color, although you could, you could definitely introduce a little color there if you wanted to. Um, but I do want to draw the poppies. They're kind of these sort of flowy shapes. They're not like really distinct. And I didn't want them to, I didn't want to be drawing petals. I can't actually see the petals. And so therefore I didn't want to draw them. But you know, there, there is sort of a poppyish shape that people recognize, especially as it gets darker in some areas of, of the flower. And that that would be something interesting to try to, you know, pump up at the end. In the meantime, before I got to the end, I wanted to make sure I didn't just draw over all of those poppies, you know, with something else I might be doing. So I just very lightly outlined some of those areas of the flowers and just sort of reserved them for dealing with later. You know, if I decided I didn't want them later, I could always just erase those. It wouldn't, they wouldn't have to actually be there. So these are the kinds of ways to start planning out how you're going to approach, uh, you know, dealing with very different, you know, we've got fine grasses, we've got um, poppies, which we see in color, very difficult to unsee the color and to try to figure out what to do with that. We've got uh, undulating landscape. We have a focal point that's actually in the midground, not up front. And then we have th this atmosphere going on in the distance. So I am going to continue to, to move forward. Um, obviously, we're going to have this entire time to draw, but um, 
I'm going to I'm explaining these steps as we go with the idea that you can kind of understand where we're trying to get to before you color in a bunch of stuff. <laughs> All right, so that was just looking a little bit more closely at how I got started with the beveled um, pencil. And what I'm doing is I am not trying to duplicate a photograph. I'm not trying to make a photographic image here. What I'm trying to do is get the feel of what I see you know, the feel of the grasses, the feel of the of the vegetation being closer, kind of chunky, uh, very organic. Then now I'm starting to add a little bit of beveled pencil also to that mid-ground hedge and some of those trees, but not not in in the uh, not at the farmhouse and that sort of thing yet, because I don't want those to have that same chunky feel. I actually want to see some detail once I get back there. So Moving on to the next step is this business of now adding some detail. And I'm going to show you this in a larger picture. So what I did at this point was I then went to those very fine beveled pencil tips and I started drawing in the area. The, the, I started with the little trees because I love those trees. I always associate that with Tuscany. Um, I think they're cedars and, and they're just beautiful, really architectural. And so I started uh, drawing in those, just sort of massing in some dark there. And then as I indicated where the building was, no windows or anything like that yet, it's just a shape, um, I used very, very small directional lines um, to, rather than just sort of shading everything in, um, I used directional lines to make some of the shading and kind of followed the form a little bit, followed what I, you know, I sort of saw the, the lumps of the, of the bushes, the, the way the, um, the hill kind of goes upwards. And while I was messing around with that, I said to myself, well, I could also use, I'll go back to the bevel pencil for a second and maybe use one of the lighter beveled pencils to start indicating some of the directional lines in the field uh, that's closer to the front, right behind those, right behind those white, um, those highlights that I made for the grasses. I don't have to do very many lines. I don't have to fill the whole thing in, but you know, that kind of gives me wider, you know, kind of stronger lines in the foreground on the ground as well, not just in the, in the foliage of the front. Um, but then I went back to the academic pencil for that little, you know, kind of the little ridge on the lower right-hand side of, of um, foliage I saw there, you know, added in something kind of a little bit lighter. So the idea with all of this, um, and here I, and then I started adding even more directional lines in following the form of the land. Um, I'm going to go back. Don't worry, I'm going to go back a bit. <laughs> but I wanted to show you where, kind of where I was going. And you can start to see how you can use these different types of leads, the, the thicker beveled lead and all of its different values of lighter or darker. And then the more the academic point, uh, you know, the more pointy pencil. And if you don't have pencil sharpened like that, do not worry. You can use your regular leads. Just be really light and careful with them and keep a good point on them. Same is really the same thing. The only thing that is different is it, it um, when you when you carve back the wood from the pencil, leaving more lead exposed, you just don't have to actually sharpen that pencil as often. And if you're working much larger, you can sometimes use the side of that larger piece of lead to get, you know, larger areas of, of graphite down. It's really, that's really what that's all about. So if you've just got regular, regular sharpened leads with a pencil sharpener, you know, all, you can do all of this stuff. It's not a big deal. Um, for the stuff in the foreground, you would just use a more blunt pencil, basically. I like having it at, at an actual bevel having sanded it down because it gives sort of a clean edge and I do like that part. But what you're doing basically is you're just sort of dividing up the different textures and the different areas of a drawing based on the tools you have, the bevy of tools you have available. And what, what do they mean when you look at them? So we already know that areas of high contrast draw your eye. Areas of detail draw your eye. You'll often see this done in paintings as well as in, in drawings, where you know one area is much more 
uh, worked and the edges maybe of the of the painting or the background are much less worked. They have less detail. So your eye automatically goes to where there's more detail or where there's more light and dark contrast going on. Um, and we see our eyes do this right here in this photo. When we look at it, our eyes are drawn to the foreground, you know, the dark and light there, the darker shape where it's drawn to that hedge running across the middle and it's drawn to the house and the trees. So since we know that our eyes are automatically drawn to exactly the things we're trying to make important, then our job is simply to uh, address the relative values. In other words, keep it darker or lighter than the surrounding area so it continues to have that feeling of interest. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to draw your scene as dark as what you see here or as light. But, but you want, if you've shifted the whole thing lighter, then everything has to be lighter in a, in a relative manner. Um, and if you shift it all darker, likewise, it, you, know, you, you want to keep that same sort of, of feeling of, of mistiness and that kind of, uh, that kind of approach. So talking a bit about mistiness, it can take you a while when you're looking at a scene to really understand what is causing the various different atmospheric um, effects that you're seeing. So in this particular case, it took me a little while. You know, I, I loved the, the picture. I go, oh, okay, this is a great one to draw. You know, this will be fun. You know, there, there are lights, there are darks. I can use my white pencil. It, it'll be great. But it took me a little while of actually when I was drawing it to go, oh, I see that this is an actually an early morning, early day scene. Um, and these, this is the mist and fog that happens when, as, as, as you've got the cool air, uh, you know, settling down, um, you've got the, the warmer air is rising, but you, you've got this condensation now, this sort of mist in the lower areas of the land. And, and keeping that in mind, once, once you observe something like that and you start to, to see it, you're like, okay, so there's some of that mist, you know, in the, in the lower areas that's going to be um, that means I'll have to use whiter pencil at the lower parts of some of these hills and less white pencil at the top. That will help me create that that atmospheric feeling of this this sort of settled mist. Um, likewise, now that you know I'm looking at this at this image and I'm working on it, I see that the light is coming in from the left side of of our picture, which means that um, the darker areas are always going to be on the right. So when I'm drawing in my darker trees, for example, those, those cedars, I'm going to want to kind of keep that in mind and look at these trees, realizing that they're not all the same dark across them. One side is lighter and one side is darker. Sometimes we can see that more clearly than others. Um, but maybe indicating that even on a couple of trees will help give that, that sense of what's going on. All right, I'm going to move us forward again so you can see what's going on. So, so like I said, I started adding in some darks in the focal area using directional lines. And um, I held my pencil uh, away from the tip to keep my lines under control. So at this point, I'm using probably still an F or an HB pencil. But now I'm using not a beveled pencil end anymore. I'm using... Uh, a finer a finer point, so that there is a difference between the lines that I'm using in around the house and the lines that I used uh, in the foreground. Okay, so now the next step, and this is actually just a clearer photo, uh, uh, camera. I, I was not able to use my scanner because my computer is, um, is under repair right now. <laughs> um, and so I was taking photographs and this one turned out a lot more clearly so you can see what's going on. So at this point, I had managed to get, you know, some of those, uh, some of that detail going around the house and the trees using directional lines. And you can see kind of clearly how I did that. And then I said, okay, now it's time to start adding more directional lines into the landscape. I'm still not worrying about the background. I'm only worrying about the foreground and following the lines that I kind of see or imagine, I can kind of imagine lines going one direction or another. So I've got, uh, the, the field closer to the foreground that's right behind the poppies, I imagined it going from lower left to upper right. And then the other land, I imagined going a little bit lower on the left, uh, sorry, lower on the right to, to upper left. 
but once again, following the light and dark that I see. Now, sometimes I will actually change the location of my paper. I'll actually move my paper to make it easier to draw. But in that case, of course, you're not looking at the reference anymore. So sometimes I will draw very lightly and um, the lines that indicate where the edges of those shapes need to be. So I'm going to go back down here so you can, you can see the reference again. Um, and that way, my undulating lines, where they get darker or lighter, really do follow what I'm actually seeing here um, you know, in the reference material. So this is sort of the next step. We, have, we still haven't even started to deal with what's going on in the, in the background yet. You know how, how much I always love when we get to that particular stage and we're adding in the background. Um, and so I am going to actually move to that next step so you can see where we're going next while you're adding in your own directional lines. So the next part, which is always fun, is adding in the background lights, paying attention also to stroke direction and relative values and not filling everything in, just like you saw on that upfront example. So I'm going to show you that larger just for the heck of it. So what this is what I ended up doing as my next step, my first go through with, with the whites, was, was now paying attention to how that also worked in the background, how directional lines could sort of create an undulating form. I didn't show all the little houses in the background, but I did sort of just leave a little bit of pencil and then a little bit of paper showing the tops of ridges of, of hills and some of those trees. And then at the very, very top, I blended in that white so that it seemed like it would go much further into the distance. So let me go back to a little picture of that while you guys are working on that. So now, at this point, now your drawing is really starting to take form. You've, you know, you've established differences between your foreground, your midground, and, uh, you know, your focal point, and also now your background. There'll be one more step after this, which is when you really kind of come back to the foreground, you darken your darks, like in the little trees and things like that, and in the, the big hedge that's running around the front. Um, but this, this is really important right here to sort of, you know, this is where the whole thing is starting to come together. You're really starting to, to figure out what those atmospheric, um, that atmospheric background is going to look like. Uh, and and I added in also a little bit of light to the um, that main field that was running in front of of the house hill. I thought I, I would like a little bit more than just paper right there, you know, in terms of, of what color to use. Um, I wasn't quite sure exactly what to do with the hill that was behind the house. Um, so I, I added a little bit white of white there and a teeny tiny little indication of a house, but I tried really hard not to draw it. And you notice I still haven't put any windows in on that building. So it is my natural inclination, and it might be the inclination of a lot of you, <laughs> to want to put those, those uh, windows in really soon in your drawing. And if you've done that, don't worry about it at all. But the reason that I have tried to train myself recently in particular not to do that is um, I have a tendency to start to want to draw, you know, what my brain knows is a window. Um, whereas if I leave it to the end, especially if things have gone well in terms of the overall shape or light and dark of the building, I'm less li likely to want to mess it up. And I'm more likely to only put tiny little lines to indicate openings and windows rather than trying to draw windows. Um, and so this is just me learning where my, you know, you know, where my, uh, stum my own personal stumbling blocks might be. Um, and this is why I think that this is a very good drawing to do twice, um, because there's no way this first time that, that all of your decision making, by the time you get to the end of it, is going to be precisely, you know, as careful or as thought out as, as you might want it to be. And you may be deciding as you go, hey, I actually don't like what Elizabeth wants me to do. Really want to do something different, even though I'm going to follow what she says right now. I actually would like to try and fill in the blank, you know, whatever it happens to be, which is, as you know, exactly what I want you to do. Um, it's not my goal in any sense to have you draw or have to make decisions exactly like me. You know, my goal is definitely for you to see how I think through a drawing so that you can see how an artist thinks through a drawing. But then you might go, hey, I'd like to do things in a different order or actually 
there's a different thing here that's important to me. I'd really like this to be all about the foreground and those beautiful flowers. And to me that, you know, I really don't want that house to be as prominent. And then I can let that kind of fade into the background with everything else. So your decision making about what you think is important, which pencils you want to use, how you're going to go about it, all of that stuff, you know, can be anything anything at all, any way that you want to approach it. This is just how I tend to kind of approach a drawing like this. Um, and I love the business of using these different pencil leads and directional strokes. And I've really actually enjoyed this summer, um, even though most of my drawings have had to be done pretty quickly. They're actually more ending up on sketches and not all of them going to this particular point. But um, this this kind of approach of how you can mix everything together, I think is is really important. So when you go out and you're drawing and you're trying to get to a result relatively quickly, you already know that certain tools are going to work really well for you. Uh, and certain other tools um, are more applicable to one situation or another. So I'm going to go ahead now and show you, show you what, what I got to as my final stage uh, and how I decided to handle this foreground, because I think that's kind of important. You know, you don't have a ton of time to work today. So um, at some point, at some point, you've got to go, all right, that's enough. I'm not going to do any more, but I do want to bring it together. So at least look, it looks as if it's, you know, finished to the same level across the whole thing. So the decisions I made for the foreground were then to go back and go, okay, I need some detail here. I am now going to add in using my more pointed lead, um, but a darker one. So I used a 2B and a 4B. Um, and I added in some of what I consider, you know, the darker areas that needed to go in to kind of fill it in a little bit. And then I added very lightly a little bit of shading to the flowers and, and you know, those areas I had reserved, a little bit of outline, and then gave them some stems. So they might not necessarily read as poppies per se, but they do read as flowers. I also then went in with a really fine, probably like an F uh, of the of the more pointed kind of the academic point, as I call them, um, pencils, and added in a little bit of a line on the left hand, uh, sorry, the right hand side only of the to the grasses to give them a little definition, because that would indicate the light coming in from the left of the of the picture and it being a little bit darker on, on the right hand side. Um, and then I just kind of, you know, if I felt like a few little leafy looking things had to happen here or there, added those in, you know, added a little bit of this cast shadow that we see occasionally across the fields, uh, you know, added a little bit more detail into some of the hedgerow there and some of the other stuff that we see. Let me move back so you can get your big picture again. Just to kind of give this now that feeling I was after, which is that when you look at this, you really, your eye is drawn to the house and those trees first, but you're also noticing that this foliage up front and you're also seeing that that wonderfully defined line of the hedgerow and that everything that's in the background remains in the background um, but it has interest and it has um, some sort of you know form going on now i could go back at this point if i wanted to and add in a little bit more detail using graphite and a very very light pencil in the background maybe to add in some of those little trees and maybe a couple of those little buildings that you see indicated in, in a tiny manner in the distance. Um, because now I've got all of the rest of the drawing worked out, I would know how very light those little buildings and, and lines had to be. And they're almost really, uh, it's almost the toned paper working you know, for you um, with just a tiny little bit of definition back there. Um, so this is where sometimes when you've got an area of a drawing, you're not quite sure how to handle it. Don't really know how light or dark it should be. You know, what pencil is best to work there. That's when it's better just to leave it alone. You know, um, as, I, as I've mentioned from the start, drawing the things that are the most obvious that you know how to deal with first is really the way to work your way through a drawing. You know, there's no, you know, going for going after a, a part that you're not really quite sure how to handle is just sort of, you know, setting yourself up for a problem. Why not finish the rest of the drawing and then see what you need to do with it? Maybe you need to do nothing at all. Maybe it isn't even important to the drawing, that thing that you were concerned about. Um, so this is how I approach a subject like this. 
you know, I, I look through it at what I think is interesting. If I need to do something kind of out of my regular order, such as, you know, indicating those grasses up front, it's a good idea to do that because that actually told me that I didn't need to put a bunch of, of pencil down in all of the fields. Only some of the fields needed that kind of treatment. And that made my life easier because then I could, rather than covering what is already toned paper with more pencil, I could go and start working on my focal point. So I hope that this is useful to you to kind of see how to work something through. We've done the much faster, uh, what I call the travel sketch on toned paper. Um, where I actually dive in, I do the, the, the light lines, I dive in and put some dark stuff down, I kind of smudge it into the paper to make some dark masses, add in some detail in dark, clean everything up a little bit, add in some light, make sure my lights and darks look good, and I'm done. Trying to get, you know, a sketch that could be done in 45 minutes or, or an hour while I'm, you know, perched on a rock somewhere. This, is, this approach here that we did today is when you have a little bit more time. You know, when you have a photograph and, or, you know, or when you have time to, to go back to a scene and, and revisit it or, or even sit for a couple of hours and just sort of really take your time with something. Um, and then you can sort of think through a little bit more how you're going to use, you know, what shape, where. So, um, whoops, I'm going to go back to the big one just for a minute so that you can, you know, just look at this again and sort of see that you, when you're trying to draw a scene like this you're not trying to reproduce it in a photographic sense what you're doing is really using the the kind of the the style of drawing that you have this happens to be my style of drawing where i really like these directional lines and i you know i like a bit of sketchiness to the whole thing i'm not trying for super smooth but other people might like super smooth you might actually want to you know you might actually want that super smooth finish um and you know, as I've said the whole way along, that the whole idea and the, and the goal of this particular class was you to find your own style um, and just sort of use my ideas as something to bounce your own ideas off. When I was starting off doing, um, you know, painting and drawing in particular, we're drawing not so much because you kind of feel like it's your own personal thing. But when you start painting, there's a real pressure to sort of think and paint like other artists think and paint. And once again, it's useful sometimes to start off with that as a basis. It gives you somewhere to start. But I think it's really important to then assess as you go, rather than just saying, hey, I'm just going to do everything person X did. Um, that's not really very fulfilling. But it is good to go, hey, you know, person X does this. Do I like that? Um, Maybe I want to do that for part of my painting or drawing, and maybe I want to try something different. So, you know, I, I keep on about that because I think it's really, really important um, that this is that you're not just drawing using a series of techniques because someone has told you to, but you're actually thinking your way through a drawing. Um, perhaps using what I say as a, as a roadmap to get you started, but then doing your own thing after a while, just saying, hey, okay, that was a great start, but I'm actually going to try something a bit different. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this up um, so that I can sort of, you know, get us through the, through the last bit here. But uh, at, at this point, if you're going, eh, I'm not quite done yet, <laughs> then I would suggest just, you know, dropping some darks in around those trees around the farmhouse. Don't over don't overdraw anything. If you've already got shading there, just leave that shading alone. Um, you know, maybe just define a few of those flowers up front if you haven't got very far, and add a few darks in there, just so that you remember, you know, what you were trying to do. When you go back and look at this on another day, you'll remember this entire process. And um, when you draw this again. <laughs> um, and, and you have a little more time to do it, you know, I think it's really great to have a drawing maybe on a board or something like that. Work on it a little bit, put it aside, go off and do other things, maybe come back to it another day, do the next little bit. Because it gives you time to think about, you know, about your approach and what, and what, and, and also to look at your drawing from a distance and sort of assess, you know, hey, are my angles right before I move on to the next part? Um, but I think that also, you know, that will give you the time to, to start thinking your way through the drawing the way you want to do it, uh, which is so important. And um, okay, let's, let's get to the next bit here.
So that was just sort of looking at how that drawing ended up for me, how, you know, we're, what I called the stopping point on this. And um, whoop, I think I just showing the same picture again. Okay, so this is basically what we did today. We started off with this very uh, pale, you know, um, outline kind of showing, you know, what we were up to very, very, uh, very, very lightly. Um, somebody's asking, asking, am I going to add in red? I'm not, but you can. <laughs> and it would be fun. You know, it would be fun to do that, um, to add just, I, I would be a little careful. Start off, start off kind of light. Don't add too much of it um, until you are kind of sure what you're up to. Um, but it would be a fun thing to do. You know, I, I always think that dropping in color or dropping in, gosh knows, you know, um, a little bit of watercolor or something like that might be a, an interesting addition to a drawing. Just because I do this in kind of a very basic way doesn't mean you have to stop there at all. But once again, so, you know, started off with these basic lines, uh, defined a little bit of where the focal point was going to be, just to sort of understand where we might be going next. Then did something about that foreground, because in this case, the foreground was going to be relatively important. Um, then started working in directional lines and then continued continued back and forth, background, mid-ground, pumping up the darks, and then finally getting to, to those details at the end. Whoops. Try to get us to the last bit here. Okay, so just to sort of wrap up for today, in this particular case, the concept was, you know, like my my dream, <laughs> not necessarily your dream, um, of sort of like, oh, that be, you know, you sort of go, uh, the reality of it probably would not be any different from where I'm living right now. You know, a, a house is a house, a place is a place. Um, but we always do have these places that we go, oh gosh, you know, if we were to, um, you know, to retire to the most incredible situation, it would be, you know, uh, I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere beautiful in Australia, you know, somewhere uh, in the Yukon, so, <laughs> somewhere in Montana, I mean, wherever it might happen to be. But you can build your own dream home, basically, or your dream scene in your drawing, not necessarily architecturally, um, but the location or feeling that you would like to have. So that could be a caravan, a tent, a cave, a tree house, um, a building that no one's ever seen before that you're just sort of making up in a drawing. Um, because you can do that, you can you can do whatever you want. That's what's so wonderful about drawing. Um, and your so your dreams and also sort of your bucket list are great sources for material for drawings because you have a personal attachment to them, to these ideas. Um, and it doesn't have to say anything to anyone else. You could, you know, if you've always wanted to visit the pyramids and but you haven't yet, you could find pictures of the pyramids and draw them because it's an association, something personal, um, you know, that you would want to do, something that's interesting to you. Um, and hey, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe at, at some particular point in the, in the future, you would be able to go, you know, go and see them in person. But the idea is that it just gives you material to draw, you know, a concept that you might actually feel personal, personally about, and a reason to spend some time. So somebody was asking me about the, the white pencil, you know, is it uh, like an F or an HB? So what I'm using is I'm using a white charcoal pencil, and I think it's just an HB. I think it's, I don't think it's soft or, or hard. I think it's just, it's, the brand is Generals, and I buy these white pencils, um, you know, in boxes of 12 because um, I use them all the time. And the Shinhan pencils I bought on, on Dick Blick. I had never seen them before until the start of the class this year. Um, it, that, was some, that was definitely something new to me. And I just, because I like to buy art supplies, it's an addiction. Um, I was like, oh, those aren't very expensive. I'll buy that set. What I liked about it was that they went all the way from, uh, you know, 4-H or whatever, all the way to like 10-B. And I didn't have a set that did that. But sometimes you can buy a set of pencils and they're much harder or grittier than you want. So, you know, I didn't want to suggest those to you guys up front. But now that I've been using them, I like them a lot. They're very smooth. Um, and they also, I, I think they're cedar uh, wrapped the wood, you know, is I think cedar. It's very easy to carve with my little pen knife. So all of that stuff has combined to to make me go, gosh, I really <laughs> like that set. I'll include a link in the in the PDF. I'm sorry, in the email I send around with the PDF uh, for that. But like I said, I have been able to get that little box set on Dick Blick. So um, 
when it comes to technique, you now have the ability to mix and match all kinds of drawing techniques, line work, hatching, lively line work, and now directional lines that follow the form to help just help you get some texture in, make some, you know, get a feeling of landscape and, and uh, distance. And using bevel pencil leads to create spaced lines. So sometimes we use them for mass massing in areas, but in this case, you know, spaced lines lines for things like the uh, the grasses or the directional lines and the fields. Um, it can really help accent a form or a landscape. Um, so academic drawing, which is, you know, it's actually a whole style of drawing, but I refer to that when I talk about these uh, leads at a point um, that we hold the pencil way back, way away from the tip of the pencil so that we can get these super light lines and then use these small directional lines to help build form. Now you'll see artists do this, for example, for figure drawing, where they're building the entire body by using these directional lines going in different areas. So if you were ever interested in doing that, this is a really good way to just sort of start understanding how directional lines can work. So uh, small, clear hatching to add detail and focus to focal areas, whether you're using a pencil that you've actually cut back like that or just a regular pencil, it all does the same thing. And then of course, toned paper, which I love, uh, bringing in white to accent and create atmosphere. Okay, so let me start, stop sharing and just uh, wrap up for today. So I hope that gave you a little bit of a, a new way to sort of work your way into using toned paper for a drawing where you're going to take a little bit more time with it and kind of think through how you can pull in the different techniques that we've been using. Now, um, I had thought that next week was sort of our like our, our mystery class, but it's actually going to be the week after. So next week we're going to do a still life. And once again, this is going to be on white paper. Uh, we'll do an, another toned paper for the for the mystery type class. Um, so next week, white paper, but we're going to be doing the same kind of approach. We're going to bring in blending, uh, um, uh, the beveled end pencils, the sharp end pencils, and once again, try to work through the idea of atmosphere. In this case, we're going to have a bunch of foliage, up close plant stuff to deal with as well, and brick texture and some other kinds of things like that. And what I want to help you think through is how much of all of that needs to be in a drawing and how do you deal with it so it so you're not just drawing a hundred leaves or you know every little divot in a brick when you have those objects up close when they're further away it's easier to, to figure out you know what you're going to do when when they're up close you have a tendency to get into trying to include it all so that's what we're going to be working through next week 